I've received some really lovely comments from viewers about the mic sound on this channel. So today, I thought I'd show you how I achieve it. Welcome back to Marketless Reviews and thank you always for subscribing. If you don't want to miss an episode, just click the little button below, click the bell, done. Firstly, a disclaimer, I'm not massively happy with the sound of my channel. The mic sound I'm really happy with, no problem. This is a small room, it's too echoey. For me, being someone who really values good sound, I know that it's not perfect yet. However, it has been lovely to get some very nice comments from you guys saying how much you like the sound of the mic. I think also if you listen to my channel on headphones, it does sound good. I'll, I'll give you that. The mic sounds great. I'm not a hugely skilled audio engineer, but I've, I get sound. I've worked in live sound in the past, so I know what makes a good mic sound. And I've kind of put all that experience and some of the gear that I have into creating what you can hear now. So. Let's get into it. So in terms of gear that I'm using, the sound that you're hearing comes from two devices. The first one is a Rode NTG1 condenser microphone, which is just above here that you can see just out of, out of shot. It's a shotgun mic. It's not exactly a, it's not, you wouldn't find it on film sets, for example. You probably wouldn't find it being used in TV either, but it's a really good kind of entry slash mid-level condenser shotgun microphone and it's perfect for what I need it for. It cost me about £200, I think you can still get it for about that, sometimes a bit cheaper as well, I'll put a link in the description, but it's great. I've been really impressed with this mic, straight out of the box it's been no trouble whatsoever. Now obviously that mic has to go into something to record what you're hearing and for that I use a Zoom H4N Pro recorder and I double checked before I started filming this and I think it's been discontinued at the moment. It's just not available on Amazon. And that's a shame because it is very highly recommended, which is the reason I bought it. Not cheap, it's 250 pounds. You know, so you're looking with the mic and the recorder as near as damn it, 500 pounds for the setup. But the Zoom recorder, like I say, comes highly recommended. It's got very good internals in terms of how it processes sound. It takes SD cards, it's built like a tank. It has two inputs as well. You know, if you want to have two mics running, you can do that very easily. But that's it, that is the, the setup. So I have the mic, the NTG going into the Zoom recorder. And a bit of an omission here, I'm using a very cheap mic stand, which was just bought very quickly just to get by. I'm going to replace that at some stage. It's not particularly stable. And I'll be honest, a cheap XLR cable running from the mic into the Zoom. Now the audio person in me wants to get a better cable, but if it's working, it's working. Just a very quick thing on mic placement. This is really important when you're getting the right mic sound. And for me, I found that the mic just above, it's quite a common way of doing it, just out of sight, above my head, pointed at my mouth, works brilliantly. Now, when it comes to sound deadening, it's embarrassing. In front of this camera, there's just a mess of sound deadening material. And I have some of it attached haphazardly to the wall. It's not stuck to the wall at all. It's the one thing which I have rushed, if I'm totally honest, and just because I'm so busy, I haven't really found the time to properly place it on the walls and properly affix it to the walls. So it's a complete bodge job. And all I've done at this stage is focus on the area in front of me. So to prevent my voice from bouncing off the walls and the screens and stuff in front of me, I have all this foam here. I haven't really done anything behind me. There's no deadening in here apart from the carpet. And that is why you do get a bit of echo if you can hear it. So before I do any of this kind of A-roll filming, I always just throw these things in front of me and hope for the best. So I put one on the, on the desk as well on the surface just to reduce any reflections from there, but it's embarrassing to be honest. Uh, but I think you'll find that a lot of YouTubers do a similar thing, particularly when their studio is being used for other purposes. So yeah, sound deadening, again, I can improve this, but it does make a difference because it stops my voice bouncing off the wall behind the camera. The recording process is really simple. Once I've got the mic in the position I want it to be set at, I pop the zoom recorder on, and I'll be honest, I've not touched the volume since I set it originally. So in terms of, and that's the input volume. So it's basically set at the moment, it peaks at about, about minus six dB, which gives you loads of headroom. It basically means that the file that you end up putting into the computer isn't, distorting, there's no clipping, there's loads of, you know, you, you get the little waveform on the on the track in Logic, for example. It's just, it looks nice. It's not kind of going like that. Nice and smooth, and there's lots of headroom above to give you plenty of room to add volume and add EQ and all that sort of stuff. It just means that once I've finished recording, I can just take the SD card out, 
stick it into my Mac Mini and away we go. So once I've finished recording and the file has been transferred to the Mac Mini, I drag that file into Logic Pro. And to speed this entire process up, I have a template in Logic called Mic Treatment, and that just has all of the settings, all of the plugins, etc., ready to go. So all I need to do is drag that audio file onto the track in Logic and start working on it. And the first thing I do is normalize that audio. So when it comes out of the zoom, like I say, it's, it's quite low in terms of recording. It's minus 6 dB peak ish, which means I need to bring the volume up a bit. And the way you do that is by something called normalization. Now I could really get into the weeds with this stuff and I'm not going to, if you want me to go into it in more detail, let me know in the comments. But basically when you normalize a piece of audio, it just raises the volume essentially because when you record into the zoom like I mentioned earlier you're recording at quite a low volume so to bring it up and make it better for a whole range of devices that it, that it will eventually be played on you normalize the audio now if you're interested the setting that I use in logic is loudness and I set it to 23 luffs again I will not get into the, the weeds with this but it's basically a globally recognized standard which people use audio engineers etc use to increase the perceived volume of music, vocal tracks, all that kind of stuff. So once I've normalized it, it's brought the volume up, I then just do a bit of EQ. Again, remember all this stuff is in my template. I've done this once and left it, but the EQ is quite straightforward. So I roll off a bit of the bottom end between 30, 40, 50 Hertz. That's where you get boomy sub bass, which you just don't want. I don't want that on my voice. And you just occasionally get that kind of low frequency rumble in life. It can be cars passing by, it can be a plane in the sky, whatever it is. So by rolling that off on the EQ, it gets rid of any horrible rumble. I then put a little boost at 200 hertz, and that is basically the, the body of the sound. So when you comment on the fact that this sounds like a very full bodied mic sound, it's probably that 200 hertz boost that is helping that. I then add a little dip at 600 hertz, which is my preferred, I've mentioned this in the AirPods Max review that I did recently, it's my preferred sound profile. It just makes it less muddy. If you increase that, it would sound very muddy and not particularly nice at all. So I, I just like it to be dipped a little bit in the middle. I've then added quite a big boost actually, at about 10K, which is about a, a 2 dB boost, which is quite a lot for an EQ tweak. And that is where you get a lot of the sparkle. And you have to be very careful with that, really careful with that. And it looks like I've added quite a lot actually, I've forgotten, but. Again, it seems to work. There's also a de -er that I add, and that is it's supposed to get rid of S's, all the S's, the horrible S noises on your voice. It doesn't have a huge impact, to be honest, but I just like the fact it's on the track, and it's it's there. It makes a bit of a difference, but not massive. And finally, there's a bit of compression added as well. If you don't know what a compressor is, a compressor very basically takes a piece of audio, and it kind of raises the quiet bits, quietens the louder bits and makes everything just a bit more glued together and a bit more consistent. That's a terrible explanation of it and I'm sure there'll be audio people out there who will be laughing at me now and get involved in the comments and explain it better than me but that's basically what compression does and it's used across all types of audio. It's used on music, it's used in, in vocals as well like I'm using it here and I've just left it very simple so I've used the stock Logic plugin for, for compression and I've chosen the natural voice setting. I don't think I tweaked it that much, I may have changed it slightly um, but you can see as my voice is, is kind of talking you can see that it's peaking at about minus five dB of gain reduction which means when my voice gets louder it's bringing the volume down so it doesn't kind of shock the audience. That's it in Logic. I then bounce that file, which means basically converting it to a WAV file, and it's ready to be put into Final Cut Pro. So once it goes into Final Cut Pro and I've done all my edits, I'm happy with it, it's all ready to, to be published to YouTube, I do what is called a, a final master on the audio. And mastering, again, I'm not gonna get into the weeds with this, but mastering is done with pretty much every song you've ever heard. Basically, after the song's been recorded, mixed, and they're happy with it, it goes to a mastering engineer, and that person basically makes it ready for consumption across a whole range of devices. And bear in mind that music may be heard in a car, on a car stereo, on a pair of headphones, on your TV, on your really expensive hi-fi system. The mastering engineer's job is to make sure it sounds consistent across all of those different use cases. Now, I'm not a mastering engineer, but I get the basics of it. And I wanna make sure that you can hear me properly and it sounds good whether you're listening on your phone, on your headphones, through your TV, whatever it is. So I do a light master and I do it all in Final Cut Pro. And the reason I do it in Final Cut Pro is because Final Cut Pro gives you access to the Logic Pro plugins. So I can very quickly draw up the plugins I need, put them on the vocal track and be done with it. Now again, I've done this once and just kept the settings. So for each video, I just copy the settings from the previous one for the master audio track, put it on the current one and I'm done basically. But before I do that, I do a very quick addition of audio fades. So obviously throughout these videos, you'll see little jump cuts where I go like this to this. And 
to cut out any kind of dodgy audio between the two. You sometimes get little clicks and things. You can do a very clever thing in Final Cut Pro where you can automatically add fades. You just select the entire audio track, click apply fades and it's done. So it gets rid of any little clicks and things. Once I've done that, I then create a compound clip out of the all of the audio. So it's just one long thing on my timeline. I then paste the settings the mastering settings from my pre previous video onto this one. And what that does, that adds in uh, an EQ. And the EQ is very light. It's just a, a final bit of EQing. And that includes a little boost to the bottom end, which again adds to the fullness of the sound. Adds a little bit of a recess in the mids just to get rid of any lingering muddiness. Oddly enough, I dropped the top end a little bit, which might explain why it's a bit too high in Logic. Uh, and I know I could go back and correct that in Logic, but I'm a big believer, as I've said throughout this, of just setting it and leaving it. This just works. I then do add more compression. Again, a, a bit of final mastering compression. Very light compared to what I did in Logic Pro earlier. As I mentioned earlier, it glues everything together. And the reason I put that compression into the Final Cut Pro Mix is because it might include other stuff. You know, it also includes my little audio ident but it also might include little sound effects and things I've put in. So it's important that all of that stuff is glued together with a nice bit of compression to make sure all the volume is just consistent across the entire video. And then lastly, I add a limiter and you have to be very careful with limiters. Limiters basically, again, without getting into the weeds, are a way of bringing up the perceived volume of a piece of audio. Now this has led to something over the years called the loudness wars where music has gradually got louder and louder and louder. And the problem with making music or any kind of audio louder and louder and louder with a limiter is that you start to lose all of the dynamic, the intricacies and the dynamic range in that piece of music or, or vocal. I'm very careful with this. All I wanna do is bring up the perceived volume so that it's loud enough so that you don't have to keep reaching for your volume button on your Mac or your phone or whatever you're listening to me on. And to do that, I use the, again, the stock Logic limiter plugin and I think I've added plus 1.5-ish dB of gain. And if you look at the, the meters on that limiter, you can see that it's peaking at about minus 6 dB for the final mix, the final output. That's not bad. It's about right, to be honest. I mean, I could go a bit more if I wanted to, but I like having headroom with audio. I don't ever want this to distort at all. That really is it. You know, the, again, lesson learned with this. Find something that works when it comes to setting audio or anything in life, really, to be honest. If you find something that works in terms of a production technique, leave it once it's working. Don't, don't fiddle anymore. I've done that with this audio. The only time I will ever need to fiddle with it is if I change the mic, for example, or something changes in the room where it's going to have an impact on the sound. But at the moment, that's not going to happen, so I can happily leave it as it is. And the process of getting the audio from my mouth into that mic, into the Zoom, into the Mac, and where you see it now is actually pretty straightforward. I can do it pretty quickly. Now I've talked a lot about audio in this video and recently I spoke to an audiophile about the AirPods Max and he gave me a fascinating insight into how they compare against really top end headphones. So if you're into your audio or you're just interested to potentially buy the, the AirPods Max yourself, then keep watching for a link to that video. But in the meantime, thank you so much for watching and I will catch you on the next video.